what is Celtic from the West? So I did a video on this topic before, but I think that it wasn't accurate enough and it wasn't concise enough, wasn't clear enough. So let me start off by saying that Celtic from the West is a theory as the Celtic language and culture developing on the Atlantic coast of Europe in Britain, Ireland, uh, western parts of Gaul, and even parts of Iberia. And that likely this happened very early on directly from a group called the Eastern Bell Beakers when they began to spread out through western Europe they eventually developed into what we now know as Celtic. This theory is contrasted to the earlier theory that Celts migrated in the Iron Age, for instance, from Hallstatt. Now, this theory, Celtic from the West, is put forward by uh, John T. Coke and the very famous archaeologist Barry Cunliffe. And they put forward a series of arguments from every field, really, that supports their claim. Now, that doesn't make it a true claim, but it means that it has a lot of evidence to support it from various different fields. And just to be clear, because my previous video, it seemed people con were confused about it, this is not arguing that the Celts were the same people as the megalithic peoples. This is arguing that they developed from Indo-European peoples, but they did so after uh, settling in these areas. They didn't do so through an Iron Age migration. They did so through a Bronze Age migration. Anyway, now that that's out of the way, let's look at some of the arguments. First up, we have place names. Now, the most concentrated Celtic place names are in Western Europe, as one might think, because that's where the language stayed in continuity the longest. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that the place names would reflect that, because place names often stay the language of their origin. Even when the language changes, they maintain they change their sound to adopt to the new language, but basically the name stays the same. So you might get a random name in Poland that is Celtic, but the majority of the Celtic names are going to be in Western Europe, and specifically in Britain and Ireland, and in Western parts of Gaul. Now according to the theory, this is because this is where the language developed. It developed along the, the Atlantic, and then it spread out east, perhaps during the Iron Age, perhaps even earlier in the Bronze Age. But also likely there was a linguistic sort of continuum, so that all of these former Beaker peoples were, not all of them developed into Celtic, some of them likely developed into uh, Italic peoples, that is the peoples who went on to become Romans. But at some point, these languages were all very, very similar. But as you get further away from where the Celtic language had its origin, then the language becomes gradually more different. Now the other thing is to look at somewhere like Britain, because in the original theory it's proposed that Britain was invaded sometime during the Iron Age. Some people even put the date very late to just like a few hundred years before the Romans arrived. Now, this is simply preposterous, right? We would, if, if it was at that late a date, we would see archaeological remains of such an invasion. We would see linguistic traits, right? And we would see place names. They wouldn't have rela uh, replaced all the place names within a few hundred years, right? Uh, it's very, very unlikely. But in Britain, you know, except for the Anglo-Saxon derived names, most of the place names are Celtic. There are a few debatable places in parts of Northern Scotland where there is scholarly debate whether the name is Celtic or whether it's some sort of pre-Celtic language or non-Indo-European language. These are debates, but they're over, you know, a, a 
fairly small number of places. If there had been a relatively recent invasion, we would expect to see the majority of place names, in fact just borrowed names, from whatever the local inhabitants had called the place. And if all the local inhabitants had been exterminated so that they didn't even know the name of the place, we would expect to also be able to see that sort of thing show up in archaeology, and we don't. Now moving on to the argument for archaeology, we don't see such a transition. We do not see after the initial beaker invasion or slash settlement of Britain and Ireland, we don't see any sort of major changes. Uh, whether you're looking in Western Gaul, whether you're looking in Britain and Ireland, we don't see major population changes there uh, throughout the Bronze Age into the Iron Age, right up to the Roman invasion, really. Now, there is some degree of change. We're going to see that in the uh, evidence for genetics, but not what we would expect to see for a, a shift of language and culture. Further, there is a markedly different culture in Britain and Ireland than there are in various places in Gaul, for instance. One of these cultural differences is the roundhouse. Now, this is a distinct trait that exists along what is termed the sort of Atlantic cultural zone and that exists from Britain and Ireland all the way down to Iberia along the Atlantic coast. And these people shared a similar sort of cultural trait. They all started building roundhouses in the Bronze Age. Now, it's the megalithic peoples that lived previous to this did not build roundhouses. This roundhouse feature seems to be specifically developed in the Bronze Age now, they didn't develop these houses in every place that Eastern Beakers settled. But nevertheless, this is a trait that's common to Britain, Ireland, and parts of Iberia that were Celtic. And so it seems odd if they had a change of, a dramatic change of culture and language, that they would maintain these um, rather peculiar round houses that were not used in mainland Europe generally. Now, archaeology has in the past been used to try to prove the Hallstatt sort of invasion model. And they did this with showing so-called Hallstatt-inspired goods in Britain and Ireland, saying, well, look, we find these Hallstatt material artifacts here. That means that there was a Celtic invasion. However, recent finds seem to disprove this because the oldest styles of so-called Hallstatt swords appear to have been made in Britain. So that it might be correct to say that Hallstatt in fact was copying models of British swords and that the steel, the later steel Hallstatt swords in the Iron Age that became famous were modeled after bronze examples made in Britain. It seems that the reverse was the case that in fact Hallstatt was receiving cultural influence from Britain that Celtic influence was in fact moving from the west to the east and this is what is in fact um, articulated in surviving historical sources whether it's the Romans talking about the Celtic spread in the late Iron Age or whether it's the Greeks talking about the the spread to the east by the Celts in the Iron Age, they're agreed that the Celts are coming to the east. So when you're looking at the archaeology of Britain and Ireland specifically, we're going to use them because they're a sort of micro example, there is no major outside cultural change within Britain and Ireland from the Bronze Age to the Roman occupation. They obviously evolve and change over time. They're importing goods, they're exporting goods. There is incoming ideas and there is cultural and technological change over that time. But there isn't something that we can point to and say, aha, this was the Celtic invasion. You know, this is a significant break in the local tradition, the artistic design or... 
this is a break with the housing design or the way that villages were laid out. There is nothing of the sort. There, All there is is continuity. And so such an invasion, a, a, this Celtic invasion, must have been so stealthy that there is no way to detect it, either linguistically, which we're going to come to, or through archaeology. And of course, the simplest explanation is that it can't be detected because it just never happened. And that the language is developed from the original uh, beaker settlers in the earliest, at the dawn of the Bronze Age, who were in fact the bringers of the Bronze Age. Now, for the linguistic argument, it really does make impossible, I think, the Iron Age invasion model. Because if you look at the diversity in the Celtic languages, it, it's inconceivable, to me at least, that it could be the result of an Iron Age invasion. By the Iron Age, they were Celtic was already being spoken in various regional dialects. And John T. Coke argues that in fact, Tartesian is a Celtic language and he believes that he has successfully translated some of the monuments, some of which he believes have inscriptions uh, dedicated to the god Luke. And these date to about 700 BC. Now there are people who agree with him, there are people who disagree with him, and there are people who have put forward alternate translations. Now the Romans comment that British and Gaulish is very similar, but that British is more rustic. And likely British and Gaulish were very similar because they had close uh, cultural and trade ties. And so their languages would have developed more in harmony with each other because they're very close, they're interconnected. And so any changes that happened in one would begin to happen in another. That's the way language shift works. But what about Ireland? Surely, if Britain and Ireland were the result of some Iron Age Celtic invasion, they would be speaking the same language. But they don't. Goidelic is a different language branch developed from Proto-Celtic. It would never have been mutually intelligible, or at least easily intelligible, with Gaulish. Now, it, you would have picked out a lot of similar words, you would have, you know, maybe got the gist of certain things, but there was significant differences even at this stage. Differences that certainly were not the result of simply a couple hundred years. Further, if there had been such a, a, a invasion that goes undetected, that seems to have, if it occurred at all, was by a very small group of people, you would expect there to be all these loan words from other from another language that existed before but there isn't now people point to the VSO word order and they say well this shows a non-indo-european influence on insular celtic that is the celtic languages spoken in britain and ireland because mainland celtic is not VSO but we have no reason to believe that this happened as the result of influence from a non-Indo-European language. If it had been, then we would also expect to find a whole bunch of other traits borrowed from a non-Indo-European language. If they're going to shift the entire way that they speak, then wouldn't they also borrow words? Wouldn't they also take other additional things from the language? We don't see that. So, in fact, there is no word that I can think of in a Celtic language that is claimed to have been borrowed from a non-Indo-European language. Most Celtic words can be traced back to Indo-European origin, and those that cannot be entirely traced back to that do not necessarily have traces that they were borrowed from another language. They might have simply been invented. That's not what we would expect to find if the invasion had occurred by a small group of, of elite warriors that simply took over the running of society 
but didn't really significantly rep replace the population or even significantly change the culture. Now, the other really spear in the side of the original theory is the Druids. This is, I think, a very winning argument. And that is, why would historical sources claim that the Druids' spiritual home was in Britain? What reason would they possibly have for placing them there? And why would Druids have traveled to Britain to study the ancient arts if they didn't in fact develop there to begin with? It's a very strange thing to consider that if in fact they had just invaded Britain a few hundred years earlier uh, prior to Caesar making this remark, why would they consider that their spiritual center for Druidry, which was really at the, at the heart of Celtic society? Why would they place that spiritual heart in a newly acquired territory that was just th thinly Celticized? as some previous scholars put it. Now, some have said in return that, well, maybe the Druids weren't really Celtic to begin with. They were part of this original non-Celtic but Indo-European religion that existed in Britain that was derived from the Beaker culture but was not Celtic, and the Celts simply adopted the Druids. This seems fairly unbelievable to me, that a group would simply adopt the religious priests of a completely other group, a conquered group in fact, would, it, would bring them into their culture, would place them on the highest pedestal of their culture, and that these priests would then diffuse into every single different Celtic group uh, throughout Europe. Because from Iberia to Anatolia, the Celts were always associated with the Druids. You know, everybody knew of the Druids. The Greeks wrote about them, including Aristotle. They say basically the same things about them, that they were natural philosophers, that they were wise men, that they practiced different mysteries, that they were somehow similar in certain ways to Pythagoreans, but that they might have been associated with human sacrifice and carried on this very ancient tradition. So, needless to say, I don't believe for a minute that the Druids were not originally Celtic. Their name is Celtic. Uh, they're at the very center of the I Celtic identity. It's possible, I guess, but I would think that they would then retain a name that is non-Celtic, would retain some sort of non-Celtic identity that separated them from the other peoples, but we don't, we don't have a, any evidence for that. The most likely reason is that they simply developed originally in Britain and then spread out from there. That doesn't mean that Celtic as a language or culture simply originated in Britain. It's postulated that it, it originated in the entire region of Western Europe along the Atlantic, but that the Celts them or the Druids themselves might have originated in Britain. So again, just to summarize this argument, it's most likely that the reason that the Druids' spiritual center was Britain is because that's where they developed. And then they spread out through the rest of the Atlantic region and spread amongst the Proto-Celtic peoples and then went wherever uh, Celts went from there. So finally, genetics. Everyone gets caught up on this uh, because it shows a lot. But in, the terms, in terms of Britain and Ireland, it doesn't necessarily show us a lot because there seems to be relative stability, relative continuity in Britain and Ireland from the Bronze Age to the Roman occupation and beyond. So there is not a lot of genetic change. Now, some studies have put a 10% shift somewhere 
in the late Bronze Age or early Iron Age, and they say this is the Celtic invasion. Now, if we're looking at only a possible 10% shift, that really isn't very significant. Is it significant enough to change the language and culture, um, yet not significant enough that we sh see it in archaeology? Uh, you know, th this is very questionable to me. Now, it's very likely that there was back and forth between Britain and Ireland, and between uh, uh, Britain and Gaul specifically, and that there were various invasions from different places throughout this time. It would be ridiculous to think that there was not. And so if there wasn't a big population change, then you have to postulate a small invasion that simply replaced the elite of the society. But if you do that, then why don't we have language, significant language change or borrowings or place names or in any of the other things that have been discussed already. That's really all I have to say about the genetic argument to this, is I think there's more study to be done, of course, but I don't think it's very conclusive um, one way or the other, right? There could be arguments, but when you look at the full scale of the evidence, like if you're only looking at the genetics, which a lot of people make the mistake of doing, if you're only looking at that, then you can you can make arguments one way or the other. But when you take in all the evidence, linguistic, archaeological, etc., you know, it, it really doesn't look likely. Anyhow, that is basically the entire theory. Well, there's... <laughs> Not really. There's many, many more arguments to be had. You know, there's several volumes of it that I have, like books that have been released, very expensive ones, by the way. That is, in a nutshell, the basics of it. Uh, the, and the, some of the strongest, I think, arguments in favor of Celtic from the West. Now, I put forward a sort of third position that tries to also take an invasion theory but place it in the Bronze Age. Now, you know, that is, I think, more plausible than the Iron Age invasion theory, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily better than the Celtic from the West theory. You know, many scholars have been working on this Celtic from the West for, I guess it's a decade now or so, and they have put together very convincing arguments. Now, I don't know what they have to say in the light of various recent genetic arguments, but from the totality of evidence, I, you know, I'm very much favorable towards this view. And I think it is, at the very least, uh, worthy of serious consideration. I'd like to thank my Patreon subscribers, Gurvmi Lamagat, Asesjak, Agus, Marigoni, Shas Gohard.